you didn't already know what a human was and somebody showed you a human brain and said, uh, in this volume of substrate, how many cells can fit there? We actually really have, you, you would have no idea what, what the density of cells per unit material is because what you can do is, and I used to do this as a grad student uh, in duck, uh, duck embryos, you can take a little, a little needle and you can make some scratches in this blastoderm like this. And when you do that, uh, for the next four or five hours before these things heal back up, each of these little islands is not going to be able to feel the rest. And it will decide that it is the embryo and everything outside is external world. And they will make individual embryos. And you get this, you get conjoined twins and you can get, uh, you can get any number of them. And so, so the question of how many embryos are here is actually not clear. It's not set by the genetics. It's the outcome of a dynamic process of autopoiesis or self-construction. Every cell is some other cell's neighbor. They have to, um, uh, they have to figure out uh, who is part of, is, is, is this particular cell part of me as the embryo? Is it part of the outside world? Uh, and, uh, and, and that, you, you, the, this, this kind of um, uh, uh, generative medium, this excitable medium can give rise to zero, one, two, up to, you know, probably a half a dozen or so different selves. And the same thing is true uh, in the brain, actually. Um, and I think this goes back to that point about Turing is we also, we, we, typically feel like unified individuals, but we know from, from studies of split brain patients and dissociative identity disorders that there's actually not clearly just one self inside the medium of our, of our ner nervous uh, system. And organs have to decide this too. Instead of making one giant eye, this one's decided to make three slightly smaller ones. Why? We have to understand how these different uh, collectives decide who is in and who's out. And this, is, this of course, has, has medical implications because uh, while evolution has given us uh, some nice um, uh, ways to, to, to uh, scale up our goals, so from the goals of individual cells to um, uh, uh, being able to, from, from, from pursuing little tiny goals like metabolic states and, 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 and proliferation and things like that, to, to working on these very large construction projects where no individual cell knows how many fingers you're supposed to have, but the collective does, because every time you amputate one, it'll grow exactly the right number. But that, that has, a, has a failure mode, and that failure mode is, um, uh, is cancer. So in cancer, this is human glioblastoma. These cells have electrically disconnected, and as far as they're concerned, the rest of the body is just uh, environment to them. And so that idea, that, that shifting boundary of the self, the shifting scale of the goals you care about from local single cell goals to large anatomical goals to once you're a neural human system, you know, much bigger goals than that, is, uh, is a way to uh, start addressing some, some biomedical problems, for example, cancer. What we've done here is um, we've uh, induced a, a, a human oncogene, and so they're going to make this tumor. But what we've also done is co-inject an ion channel that forces these cells to stay in electrical communication with their neighbors. So uh, we don't kill the cancer cells. We don't fix the oncogene. In fact, you can see here the red is, is the oncoprotein. It's quite blazingly expressed. It's all over the place. But there's no tumor. This is the same animal. There's no tumor because what, because the, the hardware is not what drives. It's not the genetics that drives. It's the physiology and the decision making of the collective. And when you maintain the collective, it, the collective remembers that it has to make nice skin and muscle. It doesn't go off to, to tumorogenesis. So um, I'm now going to uh, skip the rest of this because I'm already an hour in. So I'm going to skip all the, um, uh, the Zenobot stuff. But we, can, we can come back to it if people have uh, questions about it. And uh, just, to, uh, just to point out a couple of quick, a couple of quick and simple things. Um, uh, we, we, the basic development is, uh, is so um, reliable that we get, uh, we get lured into a false sense of uh, um, robustness, which is that, you know, we know that oaks make oak trees and we think, well, here's what the, uh, the oak um, genome can do. This, this acorn is going to make things like this, a nice flat green structure. But what we don't realize, and we don't know this until some parasite like, um, like a wasp, prompts the cells with chemical signals to build something completely different. This is, an, this is a gall formed from the plant cells under some simple prompting from this other creature. Here's another one. We would have no idea that uh, these, these cells with their standard genome could build something completely different. That morphous space, that latent space of possibilities, that behavioral space is unknown to us until we start to experiment by probing it with various, uh, various signals. Um, 
and this is so 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 this this is this is very profound this idea that that uh, living things hack each other constantly and it's not just parasites that hack the host but all of the cells of an embryo are constantly hacking each other in the sense of putting out signals to get them to do what the collective wants them to do. So that kind of, um, we can now, uh, we can now uh, say that, that uh, synthetic um, constructs like, like these xenobots that we have made uh, are a tool together with, the xenobot is actually, it's not this little tiny thing that we make, it's actually this whole structure, including the environment, um, uh, including high agency aspects of the environment, like we, the bioengineers, and lower agency uh, aspects of the environment, like chemical signals and so on, is a way to look into the various spaces that a collective might be traversing. And these might be uh, behavioral, physiological, transcriptional, and, and many others that we may not know. So um, I'm just going to uh, summarize my points here, which is to say that uh, in this in this framework, we look at a continuum of agency. Um, we I, I don't like binary categories. I think they're completely artificial. Um, I think these questions are empirical. Uh, they are not uh, philosophical. We have to do the experiments and see which substrates have what capacities. We can define selves as a boundary of goals that the collective system is capable of pursuing. But it's on us as observers to recognize those goals in an optimal way. And we're not very good at it. We need a better science of, of, of doing it. Um, developmental bioelectricity as the ancient precursor of what nervous systems do is one kind of cognitive glue that binds competent subunits towards larger scale selves. And uh, evolution, uh, of course, interacts with this whole process, but in a bi-directional way. And so the last thing I want to point out is simply this, that uh, when Darwin looked at the uh, richness of variety in the biological world, he, he coined this phrase, endless forms most beautiful. Uh, all of the natural forms are here. They're a tiny little corner of the possible state space of every combination of evolved material, engineered material, and software. All of these things, hybrids, hybrids and cyborgs and hybrids and again, chimeras of various kinds, many of these already exist and many more are going to exist because all of this is possible because life is so interoperable. And the reason it's so interoperable is that uh, evolution makes problem solving machines. It, it, the, all of these, um, uh, all of these uh, systems have to, they, they, they don't take their past uh, experiences too seriously. They don't overtrain on their priors. They have to solve problems from scratch every single time. And thus novelty is not surprising to them. They're dealing with a, uh, with a, with a, with a very unreliable medium. They, they basically, the whole architecture assumes that things are going to be broken. Things are not going to work the way you expect. And you have to solve problems from scratch. And for this reason, all of these things are viable. And that means that um, going forward in the next uh, couple of decades, we are going to be surrounded by creatures that are nowhere on the tree of life with us. We cannot use the old familiar uh, strategies of asking where on the tree of life is it? Is it more like a snake or a dog or a dolphin? Or a, a, w w these things are gonna be nowhere on that, um, on that scale. And the old uh, categories of is it, is it, design, is it uh, engineered versus natural? Is it a machine versus an organism? All of these crisp categories are going to become completely useless. I mean, they were, they were never correct, but at least in the olden days, they were a rough, a rough heuristic that you could use. And so we're going to need to develop a new form of ethics for relating to minds that are, that are, uh, that are not like ours. And that's really critical. So I'm going to stop here. If uh, anybody's interested in these kind of things, you can um, 